Welcome to Fright Night. The Review. So Fright Night tells the story of a teenage horror fan who believes that his next door neighbor is a vampire and has to enlist the help of a washed up actor who used to portray a vampire hunter. What's going on people? Welcome to another patron sponsored review. Unfortunately, Patreon is undergoing some serious bullshit maintenance over the past couple of days and I have absolutely no access to any of my messages or to my list of Patreon requests. So I can't tell you who the patron is who requested this review because that information is gone for right now. But if by the time I edit this video, I'll post that patrons, that awesome person's name down here who made this kick-ass request of Fright Night. Thank you so much for your support as all of my patrons for the continued support of this channel and for giving me cool ideas and cool requests like this. So thank you so much. And if for whatever reason this information doesn't pop up down here, please, if as soon as you see this video, let me know down in the comment section so I can do a pinned comment thanking you. And I apologize for the inconvenience for whatever reason on my computer and my cell phone, the Patreon website is just nothing but an error message right now. But I am very excited to be talking about Fright Night, which is easily my second favorite vampire film of all time. For those of you that have been a fan of mine for a while, you already know that The Lost Boys is my favorite vampire film, often competes for my favorite horror film, period. But Fright Night is damn close, and there is so many reasons why I love this movie. Fright Night is like the perfect mix of all of the old school classic like Hammer and Universal horror films and the classic now 80s horror films. This movie has all the style, the music, and the attitude of the 80s paired with all of the lore, the rules, and the approach as far as the monsters themselves as all of those classic horror films. Talk about the two most iconic and influential eras in horror films, and they are both mashed together to tell this story in Fright Night. From the story and from the certain characters' perspectives, the first thing you're introduced to is William Ragsdale's character of Charlie Brewster, and the first thing you learn about him, aside from the fact that he wants to fuck his girlfriend, is that he is a fan of classic horror. He's watching Fright Night while making out with his girlfriend, which is basically this old hosted creature feature show that's on in the late hours of the night where they show all these old forgotten classic horror films that Charlie is a big fan of, including the actor and the host himself, Peter Vincent, played by the great Roddy McDowell. And that character right there of Peter Vincent is kind of like a mix between, which also gives you your name, Peter Vincent, is a mix between Peter Cushing and Vincent Price, these old school classic horror actors, while giving it his own spin. Kind of this washed up actor who, you know, plays it more for laughs, that's, you know, down on his luck, he's losing everything, he's losing his job, and at the same time, he's lived his life bathed in this horror atmosphere and he probably has the most block as far as believing any of this shit than any of the main characters. And those two eras of horror are melded together to give us our villain as well in this perfect blend into, my opinion, the best vampire character that we have ever had, Jerry Dandridge, played by the awesome Chris Sarandon. You get into this character and this guy just has everything. That's why he's my favorite vampire. He covers all the bases, he checks all the box for what you want in a vampire villain. He's got the charm, he's got the coolness. This is a guy that you could see seducing women, seducing Charlie's mother into thinking that this guy is welcome into their house even though she knows nothing about him. Seducing all of Charlie's friends and family into thinking that he's not a threat. As soon as they meet him, they're like, bro, he's fucking awesome, what are you talking about? He's got that allure, that sexiness to him where you can tell that this guy just gets whatever he wants as far as people and women, he just, walks into a room and commands the room, which is evidenced best by probably my favorite sequence in this film, which is that dance club sequence when he finally starts to kind of charm Amy and just move into this dance floor like a force. And then you tip into the dark side, the guy is scary. He's frightening. Whenever he actually starts to charge into Charlie's life right away, the first night that he goes in there and doesn't even really want to kill him right away, which is another cool part. He just wants to tell the dude like, look, Charlie, all right, you figured shit out. Bravo. Do you realize how much trouble you've caused me? Spying on me. Almost disturbing my sleep this afternoon. 
Telling policemen about me? Have a round of applause. I'm a vampire. You figured it out. I don't want to fuck you up, but I will. If you just leave me alone, we can go about our business. You can go back to trying to fuck your girlfriend every Friday, and I'll go back to eating bitches. But nonetheless, Charlie doesn't listen, tries to stab him with a pencil, mom wakes up, and now from then to the end of the movie, it is just a cat and mouse game between Charlie and Jerry Dandridge. And Jerry is legitimately scary because he just has that allure that leaves Charlie with no allies in sight. Not the police, not friends, not family, not even the good old Peter Vincent who should be the one person stereotypically who should be able to buy into this situation. Nobody gives a fuck. Charlie is the crazy person. And it's all because of Jerry. Jerry is so awesome that nobody believes this fucking guy is a vampire. And I just love the way that that story unfolds. Like the pacing, the way that you have the three act structure of Fright Night. It's brilliant. Right away, the movie doesn't even waste any time. The first five minutes of the film, you're introduced to this problem. Next door, dude's carrying a coffin in, walks outside, sees the bat and says, this is a vampire. And the movie doesn't try to make it a mystery if he's a vampire, because the very next sequence is him breaking into Charlie's house saying, Bravo, now it's gonna be cat and mouse. You get into the second act and it's basically him trying to convince everybody to no avail, trying to convince the police and he can't keep his big mouth shut long enough for the police to do their investigation so they write him off and say, don't talk to us ever again. The mom is just lost cause. Horny single mom sees Jerry and says, come on anytime you want. Thanks mom. You get his girlfriend, Amy. You get his best friend, Evil Ed. They come in, they think he's fucking nuts. He finally goes to Peter Vincent. The one saving grace, Peter Vincent thinks that he's fucking nuts, actually sets up a ruse to try to convince Charlie that he is nuts. And that's another great sequence in this film as well because Peter Vincent has absolutely no doubts that this person is a real person and that Charlie is just some fucking whacked out kid. And all it takes is that little makeup mirror where he's trying to, you know, everybody's wrapping up, everybody's cool, Charlie's halfway convinced, everybody else is convinced, we're getting ready to get out of here. Opens the mirror, sees no reflection of Jerry Dandridge, drops it in paralyzing fear. And right there is where your second act really just starts to kick off is like, oh shit, now Peter Vincent knows where is this going to go from here. Please call me Jerry. Come on, let's get out of here. Just a minute. That goes for you too, Ed. I expect we have a lot of the same interests, you know, in horror movies and the occult. <gasps> Something wrong, Mr. Vincent? And where it goes from there is the highly entertaining and highly kick-ass third act of Fright Night, which is just balls to the wall awesome. Everything you would want from a vampire film is in the third act of this movie. The best friend gets turned. The girlfriend gets sucked in by the vampire. Finally, you have to have the bringing together of Charlie and Peter Vincent, who is finally convinced and found his balls enough to do whatever he can to save these kids and to vanquish the real evil and actually find his purpose in life when it feels like that purpose has been gone and he's just washed up and about to be forgotten forever. And this third act just gets crazier and crazier and crazier the longer that it goes on. You have Evil Ed confronting Peter Vincent, both as a fan and as a vampire. Then you have where Peter Vincent has to fight him and he almost turns into this werewolf at some point, which is weird because of the lore. I don't quite know how that works, but at the same time, the practical effects are so damn good that I don't even care. And small tangent, the practical effects in this movie. Bra fucking vo, Tom Holland. I always say it, practical effects are better, especially in these classic movies, and Fright Night has awesome practical effects. From the look of the vampires, whenever uh, Jerry Dandridge is actually morphing in the two or three different forms that he has, from the werewolf sequence where he turns into a werewolf and then turns back into a vampire as he's dying. I forget the character's name, but like the zombie caretaker of Jerry Dandridge, whenever he gets defeated and starts melting in front. But even when it gets down to it, when it gets down to brass tacks and it's just Charlie Brewster and Peter Vincent alone trying to take on Jerry Dandridge and kill this vampire once and for all. This is a long fight. This is not something that's easy. It's not a third act that just wraps itself up very quickly. This is a serious fight for their lives and the movie invests you into how far and how much they have to keep going and keep going and keep going to finally take this fucker out. So I've touched on it a little bit, but let's just kind of pause, get away from the story and talk about the characters of Fright Night, which is one of the best things it has going for it because it has that traditional vampire storyline, which is part of the classic melding of that classic genre and the 80s approach that I love. But you get into these characters and that's really what makes Fright Night stand out. 
you get Charlie Brewster, who is your everyday man. He's the average guy. He's not quite a nerd. He's not quite a popular guy. He's somewhere in the middle. They don't even really kind of dive into his school life that much. They dive into his relationship with Amy, his relationship with Evil Ed, and they give you just enough to kind of figure out where his social standing is. The fact that he's a classic horror fan makes me love him and makes all of us love him. When you're a horror fan, you see that person who is basically you portrayed in the movie. This is a guy that wants his relationship with Amy to keep going. It's a guy that wants to be there with his best friend and just kind of have life just carry on. But then you introduce the whole aspect of a vampire living next door. All of that shit just kind of gets washed into the background and now this takes over his life almost like that's his purpose. Like, what the fuck am I going to do now? This guy has to die. Which also makes you like him a lot because anybody else in that situation for the most part, especially when you get Jerry Dandridge holding you by the throat saying, leave me alone and everything will be okay. Most people would just move or be quiet or try to survive the situation as quietly as possible, but not Charlie. That moral stance that he has as a character, which is one of the most respectable things about him, about this guy is murdering women. Every time I turn on the TV as somebody that I saw walk into that house, this can't stand. I can't keep quiet about this. Even if nobody believes me, I have to stop this. And that's just a great aspect to his character. The character of Peter Vincent, like I've already kind of dove into, a guy that is down on his luck, he's washed up, his best days are far behind him, and now he is just stuck hosting this show, talking about how his best days are behind him, losing his purpose, losing his sight of what he is here to do. And then he's finally just, the purpose is dropped into his lap in the name of Charlie Brewster. There's a vampire, it's real, Fright Night is happening, I need your help. And just the character arc that this character goes on throughout this movie of just initial naivety and doubt to paralyzing fear to cowardice where he knows it's real now, but he doesn't want anything to do with it. And he doesn't want to be the hero that he's always portrayed to finding the way that finding his purpose, finding his balls and finding this fact that he does want to be that character that he's portrayed over and over and over again. He wants to be the hero. He wants to be the vampire slayer that he has portrayed time and time again. He wants to be that person and by the time you get to that third act, especially the scene whenever he's holding the cross and Jerry Danner just laughing at him, you gotta have faith for that to work. And then just one more look and that faith is there. Awesome. Even in the minor characters, you get into Amy and you get into Evil Ed, who are very, very important characters in this film. Amy is kind of like that, she's reinforcing that moral push for Charlie because it almost feels like Charlie wants to be the better person for her because he's kind of a dick as far as, you know, I just want to have sex. Can we do it? We've been going together for a year. You could tell she's kind of the innocent one that wants to put it off until it's the right moment and everything like that. And when all that stuff kind of gets washed into the background and he's trying to fight this vampire, you feel because of that relationship and the fact that she keeps coming back to help him and keeps, you know, goes out and seeks out Peter Vincent to try to help him that that love between those two characters is part of what's fueling that moral stance that Charlie has. And it makes her a very likable character too because even though she flat out believes he's out of his mind and he's been a total dick to her from the very opening frame of the movie, she still goes above and beyond trying to do whatever she can to help him. Whether that's actually vanquishing this vampire or making him think that he's going there or getting somebody to convince him that he's full of shit. Whatever the solution is to make him a better person, she's going to go do that. And when you get into the third act, when she starts getting kind of allured in by Peter Vincent, you also root for her in another stance because you're like, holy shit, this is not good. You look exactly like this old flame of his. This is not going to go well for you. And you still want her to come out of it. When you get to the scene whenever she's already been turned and she looks like the vampire on the poster, you're worried. You're like, dude, is that it for her? Is he going to have to choose between killing her and saving his own life? Are we going to be able to save her by killing Jerry? You're not quite sure where those classic lore and classic rules are at play when it comes to Amy in that third act. And it does make that scene heartbreaking and tense at the same time when he lifts her over, sees the teeth, and just screams in pain. And now we get to Evil Ed, which I'll be honest, I'm a little bit more complicated with than most people. Most people far and away like Evil Ed probably the most in this film as far as the character. He's the more memorable character. He's the fun character. He's kind of the more iconic one of the little three group people as far as our protagonists. If you add in Peter Vincent, that's four. But I like aspects of Evil Ed, and at the same time, there's aspects of him that annoys me, which I think is the purpose of the character, and it depends on how you view the character as well as the actor's portrayal on how you kind of fit in on that spectrum of Evil Ed. But he's also, he's also always been one of the more frustrating characters in this film for me, because this is a guy that 
clearly is even more into horror than Brewster is. And he's clearly a guy that gets bullied. They call him evil. He doesn't like the name apparently, even though it's a pretty badass name if you ask me. But you can tell that this guy's got some pain to him. And that all is evidenced whenever Jerry Danridge offers to turn him and he has a tear down his eye about, you know, no one's ever gonna make fun of you again, just take my hand. You don't have to be afraid of me. I know what it's like being different. Only they won't pick on you anymore or beat you up. I'll see to that. All you have to do is take my hand. Here, Edward. Take my hand. But this is a character that just feels like he's absolutely resistant to helping his friend at all costs. And it's almost like, why are you even friends with him? Because from the beginning of the movie, you're making fun of him. You're laughing at him when he gets a fucking sloppy Joe in his face. You're laughing at him whenever his girlfriend leaves him. You don't want to help him when the vampire is supposedly with him next door. Whenever you get Peter Vincent in there, you're the one making jokes the whole time. And just, it's, it's frustrating for me because he's entertaining as hell. He's a wild ass character. He's certainly iconic, but at the same time, as far as just the story and the character relationships going on, especially when you add in his turn in the third act where he becomes a bad guy, it's just, he's a very frustrating character for me. And that's one of the only things as far as a small, small negative aspect that I have to talk about with Fright Night. Because I still enjoy him despite all those things, but he does annoy the shit out of me when he starts making all those dumb decisions over and over and over again. And I love how this movie also, while bringing in the classic with the 80s style, I love how it implements all those classic lore and those classic rules, like all the vampire rules. Some movies actually poke fun at it for self-referential humor. You get movies where they like, you know, that shit just works in the movies, it doesn't really work here. But movies that actually implement some of those classic rules, I always get a laugh out of it. I always love it because some of them, are perfect. Some of them are like the garlic, the cross, the sunlight, the stuff that we see in pretty much every um, vampire movie. But you get certain aspects, like one of my favorites, which is, and I don't know what the purpose of it is or what the actual like lore, how it works into it, and they do it very well and let me in or let the right one in, depending on which one you watch. But the whole rule about vampires not being able to enter your home unless they are formally invited by the owner themselves, I love that rule just because of the limitations it creates and how cool it is. So the fact that this movie brings in all that classic lore too and actually utilizes it well for kind of the tension of the movie and not so much the laugh side of it, I love it. So again, bringing back that classic stuff and melding it with the new to create something awesome. Now part of that 80s charm, part of that 80s signature, when you have a movie like this, you always have to talk about the soundtrack. And this 80s soundtrack that we have in this movie is awesome. It's one of the most iconic pieces of the film to me, because as soon as I hear some of the score that they play throughout the movie, especially whenever Jerry Dandridge is actually kind of being that seductive charm, and it has kind of that that 80s saxophone bluesy kind of sound to it, which kind of makes you feel like you're being seduced in a weird way, all the way to like the dance sequence that I was talking about when they start playing that 80s dance song. And it's like, it's just iconic. As soon as I hear any of that stuff, I'm like, damn, I wanna go home and watch Fright Night. But one of the biggest positives that I can give for Fright Night is that this movie is a horror comedy at its heart but it never loses track of the horror. Now don't get me wrong, there are full-blown comedies with horror aspects that I love, like Idle Hands is a great example, but more times than not, probably nine times out of 10 I would say, when you have a movie that is going for horror comedy, most of the time they lean much harder on the comedy and the horror is just kind of there to reinforce the comedy. Where in Fright Night, I feel like it's the reverse. I feel like this is actually a full-blooded horror film that has comedic elements to it, that has ridiculous situations that make you laugh, make you smile, has some kind of corny, cheesy aspects to it, some of the dialogue, some of the performances, Evil Ed, that reinforce all of that and give you more of your horror comedy flavor. But it never loses sight of the horror. This is a film that keeps the tension, it keeps the darkness, it keeps the horror aspects, it keeps that throughout the entire film and oftentimes just ratchets it up throughout the runtime of the movie to where you get to that third act and you're scared for everybody's life. You're scared for Amy, is she gonna be able to turn back? You're scared for Charlie, you're scared for Peter Vincent, is he going to have to lay his life down the line to get what he wanted and to actually fulfill his purpose? Or are they both gonna make out of it? 
you don't know because that horror aspect and that tension is still there. You don't have those fears when you watch a horror comedy that's predominantly comedy. You know everybody's going to make it out, or if they don't, it's at least going to be played for laughs and you're still going to enjoy it, even if everybody dies. Come on. Mine. You want chicken, man? You go someplace else. Out of my way. Move me. And all of that credit I have to give to the writer and director Tom Holland. This is a guy that I think is probably the most underrated and underappreciated voice in horror. Because this guy has brought us so much awesome shit, so much iconic stuff, but you never hear this guy's name mentioned. You don't hear him mentioned alongside the Wes Cravens or the John Carpenters or the Alfred Hitchcocks or even the James Wands. But Tom Holland has delivered so much awesome shit to the horror genre that he's one of those guys, when you see his name pop up in the credits, you're like, holy shit, he did this too? Yes, the same guy that brought us Child's Play, is the same guy that wrote Psycho 2, is the same guy that directed Thinner, which is a guilty pleasure of mine, and is the same guy that gave us Fright Night. This guy has done some awesome shit. I wish he would have done more. I wish he would have gotten more recognition because if this guy had kept making movies, I think he could have been on that Mount Rushmore of horror directors. And for me, especially with being the guy that brought Chucky to us, he's one of those guys that will forever be indebted to me as far as like, he's one of those guys that I will forever be indebted to for all of my horror love. So Tom Holland, you are the fucking man. If nobody else will say it on this earth, I'll fucking say it. You are the man. And I just want to end this review with a short little story on how I was actually introduced to Fright Night because it's actually pretty cool. It very well meshes with the themes of the movie and the approach of the movie as far as the actual in-movie show Fright Night. So I was probably like maybe 11 or 12 years old. I was introduced to this one pretty late for a horror fan. This is not one that I grew up with like Lost Boys, which is probably why it's my number two. I was up late, maybe 1, 1.30 in the morning. It was me on the couch, my dad on the other couch. We're trying to look for something on the TV, just kind of flicking through channels, basically trying to find something to fall asleep to. You know when you get to that, that section of the night where you know you're starting to fall asleep, but you want something on that you don't necessarily have to invest yourself in or try to pay attention to, just something you can kind of enjoy yourself, relax, and go to sleep. I come across this channel, and it's exactly like Fright Night. It's a host that comes out, a modern-day host, who's introducing these classic horror films for you to watch in the middle of the night. And the guy starts talking about this movie, Fright Night. It gives you a quick little plot synopsis. And my dad's like, oh yeah, Fright Night, that's a pretty cool movie. So I'm like, all right, I'm sold. I leave the remote down, I start watching it. And I stayed up and watched the entire film. I was up till like four in the morning. So that finding something to go to sleep didn't work out. I was so invested and so excited to find a movie like this that escaped me for 10, 11, 12 years, however old I was, that I immediately fell in love with it. You can't murder a vampire, Amy dead remember listen listen i just taped this amy what are we gonna do this is just like fright night so if you're a fan of the classic 80s horror films and you're a fan of those classic hammer and universal films and you want to see what had happened when you meld all that stuff together and if you're a vampire fan especially, you cannot get any better than the original Fright Night. Actually, I think the remake's pretty good too, so check that one out. But as far as the original 1985 Fright Night, find this movie, seek it out, go out, and buy it. So what do you guys think of Fright Night? Are you a fan of this one? Do you prefer the remake? Do you like the character of Evil Ed? Are you kind of frustrated by him? Do you think that um, Jerry Dandridge is the coolest and best vampire character we've ever gotten? Or do you have a better pick for that? Let me know down in the comment section below, guys, and we will talk about it. Thank you so much for the patron that requested this. Awesome request, and as always, I appreciate your support very much on Patreon. Please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button if you have not already subscribed. Check the video description below for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Spread shirt for Cody Leach merchandise like t-shirts and other stuff designed by the great Woody Bowen. And if you want to join in the fun with these Patreon requests, check out my Patreon page down below as well, which is the best way to give back to this channel and help this channel grow while getting cool exclusive content for your eyes only if you decide to become a patron. And you can get patron request reviews depending on what tier you choose. So look into all that stuff on the Patreon page, guys. A lot of cool stuff down there. 
And if you want to check out some more of my reviews, you can check out a few more by clicking right over here.